to play chess online or learn how to improve? Join us at the number one chess destination in the world, chess.com. With hundreds of thousands of people playing at any moment, you'll quickly find a game with someone at your level, whether you're a total beginner or a grandmaster. You can play games at any pace against friends, other members, or one of our many computer personalities. Chess.com makes improving fun and easy. Sharpen your game with tactics puzzles and enhance your strategy with our videos and lessons by top masters. Learn from your own games with Chess.com's easy-to-use analysis tool. Regardless of your skill level, Chess.com has all you need to take your game to the next level. Chess.com is your go-to source for chess news, live coverage of tournaments, events, and everything in between. Experience Chess.com anytime and anywhere, whether you're at home on your computer or on the go with our mobile apps. Signing up is free and easy. So what are you waiting for? Join Chess.com today. Did you know you can watch top chess events right on your phone? You don't even need to download an app. Just open any mobile browser and head to chess.com slash events. You can see what's happening right now, check out top games, see results, and so much more. Try it for yourself at chess.com slash events. Hello and welcome everyone. This is Peter Grumper 2022 and here we are in the tie breaks of the semifinals. I'm Women Grandmaster Kerry Tazalashvili and this is Grandmaster Benjamin Bogg. Welcome Benjamin and how do you feel today? What do you think? What's the expectations of today's match? Hi Kerry, it's once again a pleasure to be joining you again here today and yeah I think we're going to be having a very exciting matchup between Anish Gere and Mitra and Drakin. Going into the classical portion, I really thought Anish was a favorite, but I mean, now that it's coming down to a rabbit tie break, I also give Dimitri and Draken pretty good chances. Uh, Anish said uh, yesterday, or I don't know, somewhere, I saw it on Twitter, you know, that uh, and Draken, he once went to all the way to the finals of the FIDO World Cup, I believe it was in 2013, by winning a lot of the matches in the tie breaks. But Anish had a lot of practice over the last, say, two years in all these online events. And he received a bracket. We see the ritual report has already qualified to the finals. And as Anish Giri and Dimitri and Draken played one on one in the classical portion, they will be facing off today in the tiebreak. And Kelly, what is the format of today's tiebreak? Today's uh, uh, format of the time is uh, tiebreaks is a bit short in time. You guys can see we do, uh, we're going to have two games, uh, two rapid games, 15 minutes plus 10 seconds. And this can be quite challenging for players to switch from classical uh, time control very quickly to the rapid one. And if the two games are draw, then we're going to have blitz games and the time will be even shorter than three minutes plus two seconds increment. And Benjamin, very likely, we might also go to the Armageddon if these players keep it go and make all the draws that ha they have already done it at this tournament and also other events, we might also have Armageddon game where white gets five minutes and black gets four minutes. Would you, would you like to explain more to our, our viewers what Armageddon really is? Yeah, so an Armageddon game is where, as you can see, white has an advantage, right? Because white has uh, the white pieces and also a one minute, one extra minute on the clock. However, white needs to win. If the game ends in a draw, black advances to the next round. Um, also, it's important to point out that after move 60, the players will receive a two second increment. So flagging is possible, but if your opponent is fast enough, then once he reaches move 60, uh, he cannot get flagged anymore um so that would be very exciting but as uh, we said we're first going to start out with some rapid games which is going to be a lot of fun for sure and yeah to yesterday's game between Dimitri and Draken and Anish Giri was fairly dry I mean the first game was very up and down very exciting and also yesterday we saw MVL leaving the tournament because he lost the first game with the black pieces and unfortunately for him he was not able to come back with the white pieces yesterday what a game we had yesterday, a lot of ups, uh, ups and downs there, but Richard managed to keep the leading as he was truly in the better situation uh, by winning the first game at the semifinals and MVL has to leave uh, the second leg of the, of the Grand Prix and he has to come back all with all the power for the latest uh, Grand Prix, which will be in a few days in Belgrade. Uh, it, from this tournament, uh, MVL gonna get seven points as well as other 
um, semi-finalists already, so he might hope for some uh, more points uh, at the final Grand Prix. Let's once again take a look at the leaders board uh, of all the Grand Prix so far we had. We can see that uh, Hikaru Nakamura is leading as he is the winner of the first Grand Prix and Levon Oronian is a runner-up and he has 10 points. Then we do have seven points over here. Uh, Lenier Dominguez, he has to play the last Grand Prix as well. And Will has to play as well, last uh, Grand Prix. Richard, we do have him at this tournament. And if he gets the maximum points, which is 13 Grand Prix points, he might have a chance to uh, qualify at the candidates tournament. Uh, unfortunately for Vidit and his um, enormous number of the fans, this Grand Prix uh, legs were not very successful and he uh, cannot uh, play at the final Grand Prix. So these are the uh, points we do have here for the players. Uh, Benjamin, let's once again take a look at the Grand Prix points and check out what the winner gets out of the event. Right, so the winner of each leg of the Grand Prix accumulates 13 points. If you come in second, you get 10. And if you make it to the summer, you should get seven points. So it's already starting to look very, um, very good for Richard Report. He's in the finals. He made it to the semifinals in the first leg of the Grand Prix. And actually, I think if he wins this one, then he's almost there. Like, I think he has like a 96% chance or something to make it. So it's looking pretty good for Richard Report. For all the other players, you know, it's still all up in the air. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be very exciting, especially this one today between Anish Giri and Mitchell and Draken, it will really determine how good their chances are of, uh, of making it. Uh, so yeah, lots of information, you guys. So go to go.chess.com slash FIDE GP 2022 to find out more about the FIDE Grand Prix. And also guys, don't forget to vote on the result of today's games. Go to chess.com slash events, navigate to the tournament, select the game, click vote and guess the results. Voting ends after the 10th move of each game, so don't miss out. Especially today, you want to be really fast because it's going to be a rapid game. The moves are going to be flying in quick. With all that being said and done, we are going to be taking a very short break. Do not go anywhere, you guys. The games are about to start and you don't want to miss this. We'll see you guys after the break.
We're back uh, and we already have the uh, first moves at the tie breaks of the Grand Prix semifinals between uh, Dimitri Andrekin and Anish Giri. As you can see, Dimitri Andrekin is with white pieces at the first uh, game and they have started with one E4 and E5. Benjamin, what is this opening and what should we expect here? Right, so this is called the Bishop's opening. Uh, we saw Andrekin playing Bishop C4. On move two, I guess he just wanted to make sure to avoid the patch of defense. And also it's giving him additional options by delaying the move knight f3. I had some games here against Hikar Nakamura in which I actually also played this move, bishop to b4. I think black generally has pretty good chances to equalize because uh, white continues with someone like knight g2. And black can already strike in the center with d5. So we'll see what Andraken has uh, prepared here. I know the knight f3 is also a move. But in either case, Black should be doing fine. And the fact that Anish is playing quickly is a good uh, good sign for him. So I'm very curious to see what Andraken has prepared here. Yeah, Andraken takes more time here. Uh, and he goes now knight from g to e2. Uh, he doesn't really jump knight to f3, which could be really more natural move. Is he um, at some point preparing to push f4 after castling? Or this knight goes g3, knight f5 later on? Yeah, sometimes that's an option, but Anish goes d5, uh, striking right away in the center, because indeed, if he doesn't do so, then white something like goes castle and a four. So here we see the move castles by Andraken. I think the move bishop e6 is the main move here for black. And white has some options. White can trade on d5 with the bishop, like recaptures, and then I think f4. But in either case, I, I think black was always doing um, fine there. And once again, Anish is blitzing out the move, so that's definitely a good sign uh, for Anish Giri fans, right? If he's in his preparation, it means that he knows what he's doing. Yeah, that's right. And now the question is how, how fast they can uh, turn from classical chess to the rapid and blitz chess. Uh, Benjamin, what do you think? Uh, are, they, are they okay to this kind of fast switch or uh, um, we might see some uh, long things here at the opening? Yeah, it's always, uh, you know, it takes getting used to uh, switching from, from uh, classical to rapid. Because in classical, you know, you can take, let's say, 10 minutes or something, even 20 or, or 15. But here, that's not possible at all. I would say taking a five-minute thing is already quite uh, quite long. And, yeah, the players just have to play, you know, according to their intuition and just go with the flow, really, right? Whereas in classical, sometimes you can take a long thing. So, yeah, we'll see. Uh, and it seems that Andraken is the first one to take a, a thing here. Let's see what he's going to come up with. I always thought that Bishop takes d5 is the main move. But I also remember that Black was generally doing fine there. So we'll see what he will do. Yeah, yeah after uh, Bishop the xd5 and uh, Bishop takes d5, f4, which, uh, by the way, just happened. Uh, in that position, White uh, tries to push f5, f6. And Black has an option to stop it with f6. And Anish Giri goes straight forward, f6 here um, in this position. Uh, do you think Andrekin will capture the bishop back and uh, um, just play this position? Or he will let Anish to have a pair of bishop advantage and he just needs the knights on the board? Yeah, I think uh, thing on d5 is quite natural because indeed, as you mentioned, if you let white... If you let uh, Black keep the bishop pair, then at some point that is going to play a role and Black should uh, be a little bit better. So let's see, after f6, pawn takes e5 is an option. Trading on d5 is an option. Going for someone like f5 is not generally considered to be good. I mean, why can try to play on the e4 square later on, but this bishop on d5 is pretty strong. Then I can come to d4 in some positions. So uh, I think the main line here is someone like taking on e5. Uh, I think on e5, black recaptures, and then I think at, at some point you do take the d5, f uh, c3, kick this bishop and try to get the center. And there are some games that after bishop d6, so uh, black tries to keep the bishop on the king side, white plays knight f4, d4, and black castles on the long side. So this is going to be very interesting, Benjamin, if we have it the first of rapid games at the tie breaks, uh, the opposite castling. It's always fun to watch and it always more exciting uh, for, for the viewers to see these ideas when both players are attacking the kings on the side. And for players, it's also quite uh, uh, challenging because uh, there will be not like dry positions when castles are uh, 
happening on the different sides. Um, and we might have first decisive result here rather than a draw. Right, and we have pawn to c5 on the board. And yeah, I think black is generally doing um, quite fine here. I think indeed black very often goes for queenside castles. And I mean, the position can become quite a uh, double edged. So I don't know, for Andrake in here, I think he might need to be a little bit careful because Anisha's in his preparation already. He's up four minutes on the clock. So uh, this opening is turning out um, really good for, for Anisha. And another way, and Jacob probably wanted it to, to go because, yeah, as we see, Anisha's in his preparation. I think Black is doing fine here. Uh, the move S6 is, is very important to stabilize the center. And so we'll see what Andre can uh, will do. Maybe he already needs to start thinking about how to uh, neutralize here. Oh, that's not a good sign, Benjamin. With white pieces at the move 10, you try to already neutralize your opponent's preparation and uh, their pieces. Um, indeed, it's, it's just not uh, the right way to start the game. However, um, is there a reason Andre can is taking his time to figure out how to um, gain some advantage? Like, is it worthy to spend so much of the time for opening? Uh, yeah, it's it's a good question. Generally, it's a bit uh, risky. And I think generally white doesn't really have any serious chance for an advantage here. Black is generally quite quite fine. So he needs to be careful. I mean, Anish is in his preparation. He knows exactly what he's doing. And then if you make a couple in inaccurate moves, then suddenly you might find yourself being slightly worse. As we mentioned, black has the bishop pair. And let's say you take on d5, right? I mean, black's going to take. The queen comes out quite actively. Black can go queenside castles. And this could easily uh, lead to a slight advantage for black. So Andrei needs to be careful, especially now with the time situation, as he's getting more than five, minute, five minutes behind on the clock. Yeah, that's right. Uh, do we have the traits of the pieces on d5? No, no, he's still thinking. Uh, oh, now it like just the, happened. Uh, d5 happened. Uh, Benjamin here, we said that c3 is possible. d4 is also possible first to kick this knight back. Uh, but in any of the positions, white can't give a check on the file. Uh, so black is on time to uh, castle on the long side. And castle on the sh short side uh, can be also possible, but it will be more peaceful position. Indeed, yes. So d4 is an option, but as we speak, knight f4 has just been played by Andraken hitting the queen. So let's see where the queen should go now. I think to d7 and, f and f7 both look very good squares. And I don't know. So, so let's say the queen goes back to d7, right? If white goes d4, Perhaps black can already consider queenside castles because the knight is not under attack because that hangs the queen on d1. So I don't know. And this is sort of what we were talking about, how black has very good development. And maybe black can already start hoping for an advantage. Also, he's up five minutes on the clock. So let's see what Anish will do here. Right. This uh, move knight f4 is not in the base, which uh, I can say right now. Um, is that the reason? Because... Black can try to give a check maybe on c5 and control d4. So d4 will not be that easy to be played. Uh, so I guess you mean with the bishop, bishop right? Yeah. So let's say bishop c5. Well, I guess we move the king over. Mm -hmm. And um, bishop c5 is, is an option for black, but it's not really an improvement, so to speak. Like, let's say black goes queen d7. Maybe now it just goes c3 and d4. Mm -hmm. So... I would think it's probably better for black to drop the queen back to d7 right away. And if we go c3 to drop the bishop back to d6, it's probably a little bit better on this diagonal because white is soon or later going to play the move d4. So let's see what Anish will do. I think both queen d7 and queen f7, those are probably the two main moves. Right. And this is the first time uh, for this game when Anish is taking uh, more than one minute uh, time from the clock to think, and he goes queen to d7. And the queen d7 has just appeared on the board. Uh, so let's see what Andrekin will do here. But yeah, I don't know. To be honest, um, I quite like I quite like Anisha's chances here. We pointed out before that black always has some, has some tactics. Like let's say we go d4 hitting the knight. The knight actually does not have to move, and it would actually be a mistake to move it. Because if you go knight to g6, then a check along the e-file, like queen e2, would be quite uncomfortable to meet. But black can just go queenside castles. Once again, we cannot take this knight because you hang the queen on d1. 
And even if white goes c3, hitting the bishop, the bishop can actually drop back to d6. Because if we take this knight, there's c5 check. And once again, you uh, win the queen. So let's see what uh, Andraken will do here. Yeah, he is down to nine minutes. And now the time difference is huge for the rapid uh, time control. It's almost five minutes. Um, but the, the thing is that if game if they trade more pieces uh, on the board, maybe Andrekin is counting on that. That will be not too risky position, and he will be still fine to have less time on the clock, as there will be not much of the threats. We're going to see this very soon, but um, I think he has to still play a little bit faster. What do you think about his pace of the moves, uh, Benjamin? Yeah, no, I think he needs to speed up uh, a little bit. He's getting below nine minutes. And it's uh, important to point out that this uh, whole opening has been played in the game between Ariban, Boscaron, and Anish Giri at the Tarsil Masters in 2017. In that game, after knight d5, queen d5, Ariban played c3 right away, hitting the bishop, but Anish played bishop d6. And after knight f4, now the queen had to go back to f7. But and actually, after d4, once again, this move, queen side castles. And Anish had a very comfortable position and actually had good uh, winning chances. But eventually, that game ended in a draw. So Anish must know exactly what he's doing here. And that's quite worrisome for, for Andrekin. Like we said, Anish already had a game here. He knows the line. He feels comfortable in it. He's also up six minutes on the clock. And as we speak, the move c3 has just been played. So I guess Anish will play bishop d6 because he's aware of all these tactics that if white goes d4, you can just go queenside castles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, Benjamin, that now we know he has played the game earlier uh, and he clearly remembers it. Uh, and that's why he's not taking so much of time because he knows what's the best way to continue. And Dim for Dimitri, this might be uh, the position that he has not seen for a long time or he has not played at all. So he that's why he takes more time than... Anish on the clock. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's very interesting. We have bishop on d6 already, and now we expect d4 move uh, to be pushed, and uh, yeah, d4 is on, on the board. Yeah, d4 is on the board, so I guess Anish is going to castle here. He must uh, know all of these tactics. Once again, if white takes the knight, there'll be a mistake, because we like his bishop c5 check, and collect, uh, wins the queen on d1. So, yeah, let's see. And on the board. No castles on the board. So let's see what Andraken will do here. I mean, I don't see an easy move here because you kind of want to develop this bishop. But if you go bishop e3, you will always be hit with knight g4, knight c4. So that's going to be annoying. Uh, bishop d2 doesn't do a whole lot. I mean, maybe something like queen b3, but I don't know. I kind of like black's position. Uh, and actually, as we speak, queen b3 has just appeared on the board. Okay, so now the knight is under attack. And where do you think we should go with this knight? Uh, this knight can, uh, can go on g6. I like this move. If you trade a knight, then black will open up the h file and uh, the rook and the bishop will start to attack the king side on h2. Uh, I like that idea. Knight is already on g6 and now it is white to uh, move the next. Uh, what do you think? Is, is, is he going to trade the queens and uh, he hopes to get into the end game? Or he will keep the knight on the board and he will jump knight e6, for instance. Yeah, it's a good question. Perhaps he should try to build out with someone like queen e6. However, I think even there, black should be quite a bit better because black can always grab the um, open e file. Uh, knight e6 also an option hitting the rook, but I guess we just sidestep and what are we going to do? Right. And actually, as we speak, knight e6 has just appeared on the board. Huh. But okay, let's say. Yeah, rook d8. I mean, I think this is looking really good for our niche. I mean, don't underestimate black's initiative. Okay, so pawn d5. Yeah, this knight on e6 is very strong. Shall black find a way to uh, either trade it, like knight f8, uh, try to trade right away, or like, for instance, to provocate the pawn with c6? Right, I think it's probably a better idea to go um, knight f8. c6 also an option. Indeed, to try to get rid of this pawn on d5, and maybe white just goes c4. Right, and this trade should work out in white's favor because this king opens up. Um, but I like I like the move knight f8 that you suggested because if white takes, 
you're going to take up this rook. Now this rook is ready to come to e2. And white can easily come under a huge attack here with queen g4 coming as well. Once again, how are you going to develop this bishop on c1 is still a big uh, problem. So I think it's looking great for uh, Anish. Yes, and also... The... Let's see whether he will play knight to f8. Yeah, also the bar, uh, the evolution bar gives uh, black here um, quite decent advantage. And when you have already played a game and analyzed the game after that, you know that black stands good and it's it gives you additional motivation and it's just perfect to know what's the evaluation of, of the position, right? Indeed, yeah. As you as we mentioned, Anish had that game against Adiban in 2017. So probably he analyzed it and must know exactly what is going on in the current position. Once again, Black always has this open um, e-file. Knight of d4 has just been played. I think a good move. The knight is defending a lot of key squares. And it's not that easy for the rook to enter. So I was thinking maybe bishop c5 is a move to threaten to take here and ruin white's pawn structure. Um, let's see whether Anish will do that. There's also I a think... rook e5 uh, tricky move, Benji. I mean, rook e5 with the idea of rook d5. And you, if you take this rook, then bishop c2 will win a queen. In the year, that's a that's a nice move, rook to e5. Yeah, to hit this pawn on d5 and to threaten this uh, little trick over here. Let's see whether Anish will go for that. Because um, yeah, I guess you do want to try to take control over the e file. I think it, it'd be a pity to go, let's say, knight to g6 and repeat here. I think that'd be a huge uh, mistake. Anish has to try to take advantage here uh, with the black pieces. Because let's say he wins this game with black. He puts himself in very good shape. Then he will only need to draw with white pieces to make it through. And as we know, Anish can be super solid with white. And it will be very tough for Andrew Draken to, to come back. So let's see how he will try to take use of his, of his advantage here. Oh, that will be a horrible scenario for Dimitri and Draken to be in must win situation with black pieces in the second game against the most solid chess player that Anish is known for. Uh, he can make draws uh, in, <laughs> in any position if, if he wants to. So yeah, he has to, and Draken has to fight in here. Um, they have uh, they have a little bit different time for now. Uh, Draken started to play faster with his knight moves and Anish has taken more time and they reduced uh, the difference on time with three minutes only. So this can be a really good sign for An Andrekin. Yeah, the time's evening up a little bit. Um, so let's see what um, Anish will do. Yeah, he's getting that in 10 minutes. Still plenty of time on the clock. Um, of course, mistakes can happen as they get low on, on time because they will only have uh, 10 seconds off increment. That is still, you know, quite a bit of time. Like, let's say you get low on time in blitz with only two seconds. You know, really anything can happen. 10 seconds is still time, but it's uh, it takes down way faster than, than you would like. So let's see what Anish will come up with here. Yes. Um, uh, Bishop c5 looks very natural move here to me to pin the knight. Um, Black cannot really make moves that easily here either. Like King b8 will jump to knight c6. If he goes knight g6 back, ooh. Is he just going six. for a draw? Oh. He's not just going for <laughs> a draw right. here, right? <laughs> you are not, you're not happy with this move. <laughs> I mean, of course, a draw in the, in the first game with black is a good result. But in this position, he should really try for more. Well, let's see what uh, Knight of 8 on the board. I mean, it doesn't make any sense for Anish. Benjamin. 196, it can be already very close to your drum. I mean, if he goes Knight G6, I think White can already claim a draw. Because let's have a look, right? So if we uh, pull it up real quick. Uh, so Rook D8 was played. So D5, this is uh, the position for the first time. Knight of 8, knight d4, knight g6, knight d6, second time. Knight of 8, knight g6. So if black goes knight g6, and Draken probably should just, uh, you know, claim the draw, because he should realize that he is that he is in some danger here. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense what uh, Anish is doing here, repeating the position, because and Draken can now just gain time on the clock. I think it would be, once again, a serious mistake to just repeat, because the position looks uh, great for him. But let's see whether he will go for it or or... 
he will keep playing. Yeah. Um, oh, oh no. And 96 on the board. Oh no. Are we gonna see a quick draw here? Yes. I think I think so. 100%. I think yeah. I, and Draken's got to take the draw here. Oh wow! Let's we might it. see Armageddon if they keep to go like this. And uh, what do you think? Well, it's a little bit early to talk about that. Of course, Anish has the white pieces in the next game. That's probably what he's banking on. Uh, normally in a match, like we said, a draw is a very good result. In, in the first game with the black pieces, you get that annoying black game out of the way, and then you can press with the white pieces. And a draw has just been agreed. Yeah, I think a serious mistake by Anish. I mean, it looked like he had a great position with the black pieces, and if he wins this game, he would put himself in a great uh, position to, to win this match. So yeah, that uh, was a beautiful game indeed. Uh, very nice opening. I would love to play this with black if I have a chance. But instead of repeating, Manish had a choice to play bishop c5, to bring this bishop on b6, maybe to cover a little bit the queen side, and then try to um, push the uh, pieces on the king side as black is truly very strong in this position and has not a problem. And white bishop on c1 is not developed and it's very hard to find any any square for this bishop where it will be active and have some targets. But yeah, we do have a draw in the in the first game. Um, so Benjamin, that, that's it. That's it, what we have and we can really change it. Yeah, so a uh, draw in the first game, quite a disappointing uh, result for um i need i mean beforehand this would be a good result right i mean he's playing with the black pieces but i mean he's got such a good position right like all speeds are active so it feels like a ways not to try and, and, and win this game uh but it is what it is it's all going to come down to the second game if that one ends in a draw we'll move on the blitz so for the neutral spectator for dimitri and jake and fans they must be quite happy with this result but with all that being said and done you guys we are going to be taking a very short break. Do not go anywhere. We will be right back with game two of the rapid tie break between Dimitri and Draken and Anish Giri. You do not want to miss this.
Welcome back everyone. This is Peter Grand Prix 2022, second leg, and we do have the tie breaks of semi-finals. Two players, Dimitri Anrekin and uh, uh, Anish Kiri right now are fighting for the final state of the um, finals of the Grand Prix. We do have here the tie breaks, which means that the time control is not standard. And what do we have? Which time control do we have here, Benjamin? Right, so we're still in the rapid portion, so two rapid games of 15, 15 minutes plus a 10 second increment. So the first game just ended in a draw. Anish had quite a pleasant advantage. However, he decided not to take any risks and just to repeat the position. We'll see whether that will be a mistake. I mean, if he wins his next game quite convincingly with the white pieces, who is he to blame? But if uh, the player, if this next game ends in a draw, the players will move on to the blitz portion with uh, three minutes plus a two second increment. And if that is still tied, they will move on to an Armageddon game where white will have five minutes and black will have four minutes. However, white will need to win. Also, it's important to point out that the players will receive an, will receive a two second increment after move 60. So Caddy, uh, what is the bracket like? How did the players get here? Yep, we had 16 participants uh, when we started the second leg of the Grand Prix, but it is um, knockouts. We had a knockout stage and out of 16, we have now the final four. Uh, and also um, for now, uh, and, and we know that Richard Rafford will be playing in the finals and we know that MBL is out of the competition as he lost the match uh, against Rafford with one and a half to half. And Richard Rafford is the person who is right now relaxing, waiting for the results to come, probably also ob just observing what's happening in this uh, game and just having best day, best rest day. Uh, what do you think, Benjamin, who uh, Rafford prefers to play against in the finals? I think he will prefer to play against Mitch and Drake. And I mean, Anish Giri is a very, very strong player, especially in classical chess. So, I mean, if I would be to report, um, of course, and Drake is, an is another extremely strong player, but um, of course, we got to, you know, be, be honest and, and say that Anish is the fair. I mean, he's high rated by like 50 points in, in classical. So, if you report, uh, you would hope that and Drake makes it through. But in either case, it's going to be a very tough. Uh, final for him but uh, yeah it's looking pretty good for uh, reports chances to make it to the candidate tournament especially if he wins the final match i think he's more or less there but there will be one more lag in berlin and let's have a look there at the groups yes uh the final uh, leg of the grand prix series of 2022 is just like this as you can see on the screen we can uh, we can predict that the group A will be the most challenging for everyone as we do have um, the winner of the first leg and the runner-up of the first leg, Aronian and Nakamura playing in the same uh, group. And here we have the uh, uh, semi-finalist, Andrekin also joining them. There is another player, uh, this is uh, Oparin, who joins this uh, players in group A and in group B, we have Mamadirov, Dominguez, Dubov, and Kemar. So uh, Dominguez, Kemar, and Dubov have played into the first leg and they um, now did not really take a part of the second leg. Uh, and Shahrir joined the second leg, however, was not very successful for him and he was knocked out um, at the um, group stage. Benjamin, what do we have in the group C and D? Yeah, so in group C, we have Wesley So, who came in second in the group in Berlin. So it will be tough for him to make it, but perhaps if he can win that, like he still has a chance. Also, MVL, who got knocked out here in the semis, of course, also still has a chance. Uh, Sam Shanklin, he came second in the group. It's looking pretty tough for him. If he wants to have any chances, he will need to win uh, that, like, as a Grand Prix. But even then, it will, uh, it will be tough. And then in Group D, I think Anish Giri has got quite a favorable group again. Uh, he is in the same group as Nikit Vichigov, Yu Yi, and Tabata Bai. So yeah, either way, of course, every group is really tough. But yeah, that, that group between that group uh, A is going to be an absolute nil biter because it really depends on whether Aronian or Hikaru makes it through. I think if Hikaru wins the group, he's pretty much almost there of qualifying to the candidate tournament. 
but of course it's gonna it's not gonna be easy. I mean, Levon Aroni is one of the best players in the world. Uh, he really crushed his group in Berlin. He won with something like four and a half out of six. Very, very convincing. So it will not be easy. And yeah, whoever comes in second probably doesn't have any real chances of making it. Yes, Savage. I mean, Aronin have been played uh, uh, the, this tournament under USA flag. And it was the first classical tournament he appeared with this flag. And it turns out that he has to now fight against his teammate and the a uh, person who also c- represents a uh, USA team, uh, which can be quite um, heartbreaking for the fans of these two players, as um, Aronian and Nakamura truly are considered to be those two players who will fill the final two seats at the Candidates Tournament 2022 in Madrid. This tournament is going to happen in June this summer, and the winner of the Candidates Tournament will face Magnus Carlsen at the World Championship match. So uh, that's a long way for the for the players in this to get to the World Championship circle uh, and the match. But um, on the way, they are also gaining some um, money. And this tournament is uh, very good, uh, good to get really good money prize. And uh, Ben Diamond, what the winner gets. Yeah, so the first prize is 24,000 euros. Wait, actually, as we speak, the moves are appearing on the board. So let's um, go to that. So we have another Sicilian defense. So actually, in the group, no, wait, in the classical portion, uh, Anisha played move the move B3 on move uh, 3. But right here, he's going for, for the main lines with D4. And Dragon playing a Taimanov with the move A6. And on his trades on c6 and goes vision d3. So I think here d5 is the main move, white castles, and then knight to f6 from black. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are playing faster this uh, game than the previous one. And uh, we already know that Andrik feels very good in Sicilian defense, as uh, he he says that it's easy to remember the lines, <laughs> which is quite uh, strange to hear as Sicily is one of the sharpest offendings with a lot of side lines in the main lines. Uh, but since he has been worked a lot, but Benjamin, what is this queen f3 move? Where the queen goes? What's the idea of this move? Yeah, so queen f3 is a, is a tricky move. The queen also wants to go to g3 to hit this pawn on g7, which is not that easy to defend. Let's just show it real quick on the board, like bishop 7 g3 can be a move because if you castle then you have to deal with bishop h6 which is slightly annoying uh because if you go knight h5 why well, goes queen g4 and this knight is under attack so after queen f3 and drake can play the move bishop b7 i'm curious to see what anish will do here i mean he has lots of natural moves like rookie one bishop four just bring more pieces into the game white is a slight lead in development also black king is still in the center however black center is pretty solid so it's not that easy to break through and i just wanted to point out real quick what happened in the in the classical uh, portion i mean the players also started out with e4 c5 knight of three e6 and in this position anish played b3 but in this game he went for the move d4 yeah obviously he doesn't uh, want to go to the main line as so andrekin would also have some time to look and uh, improve the opening uh, stage uh, and now we do have totally different uh, position here with um, in other ideas. And uh, Benjamin, will this be a sharp position or we might end also some boring uh, setup from both sides? Yeah, I think the position is generally going to become quite, uh, quite sharp here. It's always a very interesting battle um, in... Uh, uh, what was I going to say? It's always going to be a very interesting battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, white is generally a bit reluctant to play e5 because black goes knight at d7, hitting this pawn, and then black is free to go c5, open up this bishop because white no longer has any pressure on the center. Um, so we'll see what um, what Anish will do here. It seems that he is out of his preparation and that he is thinking here. Yes, he's, um, he's thinking and rookie one has been played. Rookie one is the uh, most uh, played move here at this uh, point. And 
in most of the games, white goes with this move to uh, bring some tension in the center and threaten some sort of bishop g5, e takes d5, and open up the center. Indeed. So I think it's about time for Andraken to play someone like bishop e7 so he can get castled. But once again, if he goes bishop e7, then with queen g3 will always be quite annoying hitting this pawn. And the question is what black is going to do. Like black can go knight h5, hitting the queen and defending this pawn, but why can just step up with the queen, hit the knight? And now you have to play someone like g6, which creates a lot of dark square weaknesses. So that is not really ideal. You can um, you can castle here, but then once again, white has to move bishop h6. I think knight h5 doesn't solve your problems once again, because white goes queen to g4, hitting the knight. Um, let's say black makes a random move, then this whole trade is generally really good for white because black has an open king and these double pawns. So black is probably forced to go in 98, which is a bit passive. So I kind of like Anish, Anish's position here. Yeah, there is uh, some difficulty for black to develop the king side and castle. Um, is there any other way that uh, black can um, try to uh, castled rather fast here in this position instead of uh, it's a good, b7? It's a good question. Yeah, I don't really see what other move would make sense. Like, where else can we develop this bishop right move? I mean, we cannot develop it to d6 because then e5 wins a piece, so that doesn't quite work. Bishop b4 can be a move in some positions, but it's always a bit risky because this bishop. It can be hanging in some variations. Uh, if I go z5, knight b7, and then queen g4 hitting this pawn and the bishop. So that's also not quite ideal. So I don't know. I, I kind of like I kind of like Anisha's position here because I think you have to play bishop b7, uh, but then queen g3 will be annoying to deal with. And probably and Draken realizes that, but I don't really see what else he could do. Yeah, he's taking a lot of time here, uh, and this is the first time when he. And Rekin decides to invest this much of the amount. Uh, if uh, Black here closes the center, oh, Bishop e7 uh, was happened uh, with d4, this would allow uh, White to bring knight b1, knight d2, knight c4, and to have very good um, uh, position in there. So, yeah, knight b1 uh, just would drop back and very quickly develop this knight to c4. This seems to be a very good position. And uh, what we have currently at, at the board, queen g3, here black has um, three moves. Uh, it can be king f8. If you're, if you're afraid of castle and bishop h6, you can play uh, king f8. Uh, and you can also play g6 first and then castle. But all these moves are sort of weakening the king side uh, for black, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, black has to make a concession here one way or another. King of fate, of course, not ideal because the king. Well, the king of fate is not so much a problem. The real problem here is the rook on h8, which is now blocked in. Like, how are you ever going to bring this rook into the game? I think he probably has to cancel. Anish is going to go bishop to h6. And I think you have to go knight 8 It looks like the only move, but it's, of course, a little bit passive. Perhaps white just brings more pieces into the game with rook to d1 and has should, should have a slight uh, advantage. Bishop h4 can still be met with queen g4, keeping this pin. Um, so, yeah, it looks like Anish is really having the initiative here in the openings. I mean, he had a great position in the first game with the black pieces, and now he's putting a lot of pressure on Andraken from the very beginning as well. Yeah, two, two games uh, where you don't have much of the problems um, in the opening. It also reflects your uh, clock and Anish... Uh, is very close to the starting uh, time, 14 minutes and 50 seconds. And then Draken once again has uh, some struggle also on the clock. Hmm. That's very interesting, interesting um, uh, game indeed. Anish just mentioned before the match that uh, he considers Andraken to be the leader and he considers him, himself to be an underdog in the match. Do you think he was joking about this, or he really meant it? Uh, it's a good question. I think he was half joking. Well, I think he said something like a couple, maybe maybe before he would consider Andraken the favorite, because as you mentioned, 
he uh, he was always very good in rapid and blitz and in one of the world cups he made it all the way to the final winning all these tie breaks however he also added that he played a lot of uh, rapid and blitz online and that experience should come in uh, in handy but we have to move h5 on the board by intriguing but i wonder can white take the pawn anyway like what happens if we if we just do so if you if you take here black has two options either to play rook uh, h7 and after queen g3 push h4 right away and start to annoy king side this is one option uh, bishop d6 later and knight g4 another option is to play rook to um g8 and after um. queen h6 um some sort of lines like um knight g4 rook g6 yeah perhaps black and black perhaps black can try something like knight g4 hitting the queen with some sort of initiative but it feels a bit speculative, right? Like maybe I can even just take another pawn or drop the queen back uh, somewhere, uh, maybe to, to like d2 or something. So it's maybe, you know, what's maybe black sided to play bishop c5, queen b6 really quickly and attack f2 pawn. And at some point, he can even castle alongside and bring uh, just connect to rooks. So uh, this rooks can uh, double on g pile too. I like this decision of uh, of uh, Andrekin to go uh, h5 and have some sort of uh, um, creative position and something new that uh, Anish might not know. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, decision. Yeah, let's see how Anish will um, deal with it. Yeah, Black like gets some some initiative here, but of course, if it doesn't work out, Andrekin will just be down a pawn. So I think this is also sort of a Guts call, right? Like whether Anish just trusts that he can uh, can take here. Of course, okay. So let's say he doesn't take on g7, right? I mean, what else can he do? Maybe develop this bishop somewhere to bishop g5 to stop h4 pawn also coming forward. Yeah, I like bishop g5. Yeah, just developing the bishop it stops h4 because I guess we just take. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I think white should have quite a pleasant advantage here. Bishop g5 is a move I like. Perhaps also bishop f4 is an option. Uh, although maybe here, but to h4. Is the queen getting trapped here? The answer is <laughs> yes, because you go here. Queen g5, rook h5, queen g7, bishop f8. And the queen is trapped. So h4 is a positional threat. So indeed, I think I like what you suggested, like either taking the pawn or bishop g5 to stop the pawn from coming to h4. Yeah, bishop g5 stops the pawn coming forward and also at some uh, positions threatens um, to take the knight on f6, bishop takes f6 and e5 to win g7 pawn in that way. And there will be no to the, that, that kind of trust to cap the trap the queen. Or you can, after bishop g5, without trading, push e5 right away and uh, try to traded up square bishops and uh, Anish just went with h3. He is now stopping h pawn to come in all the way to h4 and h3 itself. Indeed. So let's see what Andragon can do here. So I guess if black was h4 now, uh, this move bishop f4 is actually quite unfortunate because it blocked the white's queen uh, way back. So white can take, and once again, it's rook h5, and now after rook h5, we can go back to let's say d2 or, or f4. Um, and if black goes to g8, then the queen comes to h6. And I'm not quite seeing it here for, for black. And at the same time, I mean this is still quite annoying. G6 is a move, however, there will there might always be sacrifices in the air. So goes king f8, Benjamin, and he tries king to guard the g7 pawn like that. Uh -huh. Maybe he does want to play g6 and king g7 later on. Interesting. Yeah. Is, uh, is there a chance that white will start to uh, push the pawns on the king side? Or first it's better to end development and then just wait the opponent as well? Like something like f4 f4 f5 e5 these kind of moves yeah so f4 is an option um oh yeah f4 f5 perhaps uh 
makes a lot of sense to try to put pressure on Black's uh, king side this way. You can also just keep developing your pieces while let's say bishop of four rook 81. And I think it would be actually a mistake here for, for Anish to play the move e5 hitting the knight because the knight just drops back. Once again, we know that now Black is free to go pawn a c5. And also this problem, the king is solved quite conveniently by going g6 and king g7. So we have more moves on the board on each plate, bishop to f4 and h4 by black. Yeah, and queen is already on f3. This queen maneuvering here, queen of three, queen g3, already damaged a little bit by black's uh, king side uh, structure. The king is not castled and cannot be castled, and the pawn on h4 might be the weakness for long term in the end game or even after bishop g5 uh, the rook has to be stuck there for to guard this pawn so this is what actually um, by this maneuvering a white uh, got um right so to me g6 here seems to be a little bit too um uh, too ambitious that it are, uh, we can sell more dark squares on the king side and I'm not sure about the bishop on b7. Maybe black has to find some, some way to um, get rid of this bishop or activate this bishop. What do you think? Yeah, it's not easy indeed to activate the bishop on um, b7. Because I guess if you play pawn on c5, we probably always take here. I mean, if, I take, if black takes through the knight, then something like bishop e4 always looks extremely annoying. You can take with the pawn. However, I mean, white has a lot of pressure here on the center. Maybe just... Rook 81 and the position really looks um, great for white. So I think the main problem here for Andraken is that I don't really see a good move here for him. Like, what, what does he do in Anish? Bishop basic uh, ideas. Right, maybe a5 and bishop a6, right. Yeah, I like that idea. I guess white's play is always pretty easy with most like rook 81, just slowly improving the, the position. Uh, so we'll see what Andraken will come up with here. Yeah, um, there, there is like black is out of some moves. Rook b8 is impossible as this bishop controls it. G8 was played. Wow. Uh huh. All right, makes sense. Yeah, maybe he wants to go for g6 eventually. Rook 81 by Anisha. I like the fact that he played this move quickly. It looks very natural, brings another piece into the game. And it just passes the move to Andraken, right? He's saying, like, okay, what are you going to do? Right? And Draken just spent one minute on king to g8, which is not. A very useful move so um it sort of signals that he isn't quite sure as to what he should do here and h5 That's has fine. been played this uh, um hits the bishop and white should not give up this bishop as this is very good uh, diagonal for it maybe bishop h h2 makes here some sense or you can also play bishop b5 first uh, but surely should not uh, let the black to capture the bishop Right, and he has just played the move bishop to h2. So let's see what Andraken will um, do here. Perhaps g6 and king g7, but it all, all looks a little bit loose. Perhaps white at some point can try to move the knight out of the way and try to break with c4. And we have bishop d6. Interesting move. So here do you think I need to just trade? I mean, e5 is also an option, but generally I think black... The, the structure generally is fine for black there. However, white does gain quite a bit of time. Perhaps you can once again move this line and go for c4. Right. Um, if white trades the bishops, then queen comes on d6, and I think uh, black should be happy with that decision, as then you can play queen f4, knight f4, and try to activate the pieces. Um, is there uh, the way um, e5 is one way? to be played. Um... Yeah, e5 is an option. I wonder if Anish can maybe also once again move this knight and go for c4. It's a bit more uh, straightforward. I guess black will take, we recapture. I mean, there's a check, but if we just move back, I wonder what black uh, really gets. And once again, it feels like our play is pretty straightforward. So let's see what uh, Anish will do here. But overall, it's looking really good for him. He's up two minutes on the clock. The position looks pretty pleasant. I mean, he has all of his pieces developed. This rook in h8 is kind of blocked in. This king on g8 always has some issues because, okay, it cannot go here because it steps into this diagonal. 
G6 is an option, but Black's uh, whole position looks kind of fragile. Um, yeah, Black, uh, white, white spaces are uh, very uh, well coordinated. The rooks control this central uh, uh, files. All the pieces are connected. And Black has this bishop on v7 stuck with the pawns. Uh, rook on h8 stuck there, cannot be connected. Um, knight on h5 in the in the corner. So it's a little bit this coordination of black species here and it's uh, pretty much uh, visible. And also you can feel it that you can so freely make your next moves here with black. Indeed, yeah. So uh, let's see what Anisha will come up with. It looks uh, it looks like a tough position for Andrake and as you mentioned, he does not seem to be having any easy moves. But yeah, I, I like this idea of, of trying to break with c4 and put pressure on the center. Because for now, black center is fairly solid. The question is, what are you going to do? And instead, he okay, so he trades on d6, black recaptures. Uh, 94 maybe still on c4 looks pretty good. There is e5. However, I think black should be happy about that because that closed the center. Yeah, black should be if, uh, happy after e5, then black will push c5 and d4 and uh, or c4 and try to activate also the bishop on b7. What's his idea why he traded the bishops? Because he could he could make any move and let black to capture the bishop, right? He's um, preparing something, maybe knight e2 to avoid queen f4, knight f4, and he still wants to push c4. Yeah, knight e2 also makes a lot of sense with the same idea. I guess perhaps he felt like, okay, so let's say he does play 92, right? So if he goes 92, black can take, we recapture. And if black goes queen d6, we are pretty much forced to go king g1, which leads to the same position anyway, right? So then the question is, why would you not take on d6 uh, to limit black's options, right? The queen has to come to d6. And actually, Anish has played the move e5, hitting the queen, and black went queen b4, attacking the spawn on b2. Right. But actually, well, for now, this pawn on b2 is not really hanging because after queen b2, uh, white was was winning a material rook b1, uh, uh, hitting the queen and the bishop in the end. And if you take the knight, then bishop h7 wins a queen. So <laughs> king g8 was <laughs> nicely played for uh, for white. And yeah, this is the position can happen. But anyways, uh, Anish goes with knight two here. I think he just avoids um, queen f4 or knight f4 moves. Uh, and once again, the pawn on b2 is uh, the poison pawn cannot be captured. Right, due to rook b1 and you win the bishop on b7. So let's see what, Andre what Andrejkin should do here. I think something like g6 makes sense. So you can go king to g7. I mean, why can go a c4? But if you just ignore it, it's like, how bad is this, right? I mean, you go king to g7. It feels like white is better, I guess, but it cannot be too bad for black, right? Um, yeah, it's not so bad, actually. Uh, g6, g6 is on the, on the board. Right. And each better is still two minutes on the clock. So let's see. So c4 makes sense. What else can... Uh, can I do here? I'm thinking something about c c3, bishop c2, rook d4 to start to annoy these uh, pawns. Like you can attack the pawn on h4, you can bring the rook on b4 as well. Right, and he has just played the move c3, hitting the queen. Now it's important to note out that black can still not take here because we go rook to b1, hitting the queen. And if you go queen to d2, trying to make contact with this rook, white goes rook e d1. The queen has to move, and then we take this bishop over here, and we win the game. So instead of all that, and Drake can drop back to e7. So I guess now Anish should go for c4. He can also try to go for b4, trying to establish a dark square blockade with knight d4 coming. Uh, that's very much an option as well. White can also uh, try to... Uh, I was thinking to try to get the knight uh, on g4, and then, mm -hmm. like, it will be very good to access on f6. Um, but this might be a long way and not easy to achieve. Yeah, I think putting the knight on g4 is going to take too long because uh, you'd have to play something like knight d4, c2 to e3 c2, to g4. Yeah. 
but in the meantime, Black uh, will get his own play organized. And even if the knight lands there, right? This time, h5 is still covering the square. So let's see what else I need to do. Maybe c4 is an option, um, or perhaps b4. But yeah, I need to still up a little bit of time on the clock, but it's evening up slowly but surely, right? And Draken has around six minutes. I need now seven. So this is going to be quite a tense fight, I believe. Uh, yeah, this is getting very close, both players now. Also, Andrekin solved some of his problems, as the center is also close, it's not too much tension there. He just needs to maybe play king to seven, maybe a5, the other side, bishop a6, to also bring these bishops at the light spot. And um, if all this can be done by black, then Andrekin can be just fine. Right, and as we speak, and he's getting down to six and a half minutes, so he's only up half a minute on the clock now. Uh, let's see what he will come up with. And indeed, if Black gets some time to go King G7, maybe C5, bring these rooks into the game. I don't think Black has too much to worry about. I mean, this line H5 is slightly off, but it also isn't too bad. I mean, it's controlling some squares. So and he's just thinking here, um, time has, by the way, completely evened up. Six minutes is not a lot of time for both the players. Um, so let's see what he will do here. Yeah, and now we do have five minutes and 50 seconds for both players. Uh, and the uh, time gets equal. Right. Uh, Anish still has a move. He's getting down to five and a half minutes. Um... Hmm. I wonder what he's thinking about. Okay, B4 on the board. Okay, so it makes sense. I guess he wants to go with knight of D4, trying to establish the blockade there over the light squares. A5 and A3. Uh, if, uh, if black takes the B uh, pawn on B4, then white also uh, takes uh, with the uh, B pawn, and then white will try to control uh, the file with rook a1. Uh, I like this move knight d4, knight b3 to access on c5 square or, or a5 square. And uh, yeah, this knight will not have an opponent. The black knight h5 on h5 is just too far from all the actions. Indeed, yes. And I land on d4, that will be pretty annoying for, for black. Uh, so let's see what Andrejkin will do here. I mean, I would think that if he goes, let's say he goes king g7, right? We go knight d4. And if he goes c5, I guess white might always have some sort of dynamic possibilities. I mean, there's root to be one. Perhaps maybe even bishop takes g6 in some positions. Because if you take with the pawn, there's this fork. Um, so you're forced to take with the king. And black might just be doing fine here because after queen g4, there's this. But actually, as we speak, None of that has happened, and Draken played the move bishop a6. Mm -hmm. He also tried the, uh, this bad bishop on the light squares. If uh, white keeps the bishop on the board, I'm sure he would be happy to trade the bishop for a knight and have the position with a black uh, knight on h5 and white's bishop. So after knight to d4, bishop has been uh, traded. Uh, here, knight c6 would be a losing, uh, I suppose, as uh, queen can go on c7 and try to attack the knight. Um, and uh, yeah, this is not the best scenario. So white takes the bishop with the queen and remains the uh, target on c6. Um, Benjamin, now if black goes c5, then knight c6 and knight a5 wins a pawn. In the, yeah, uh, well, you can go here hitting the queen as the queen moves over. We can take this pawn over here. So that would probably be a bad idea. So maybe what black should do is trade on b4 first. White recaptures, I guess, with the a pawn. Mm -hmm. And then we go c5. Uh, and if knight c6, queen c7, it feels like black should be doing more or less okay here. Um, and okay, you can always take, of course, we recapture. And maybe rook b1 to try to bring the rook to b7. But I mean, the position is getting quite simplified here. But actually, as we speak, Queen b7 has just been played by Andraken. And what happens after knight b3? What is Andraken's uh, idea? I guess if knight b3, we have to take, right? Because, I mean, a4, knight c5, this pawn will become a serious weakness. 
So, but none of that has happened. I need to play them of rook to b1. So let's see if black takes. Is there, I mean, taking the rook looks like too much to me, or is it an option? Because you follow with rook b1 real quick. Uh, yeah, but you also create the uh, weakness on a3, and uh, maybe white doesn't want to. Uh, True, yeah. So you can also recapture with, uh, with one of the pawns, then, I guess. Yeah, queen a6 was a move there, I think, after a rook before. Queen a6, and if you give a check on the back rank, then king g7. Okay, so Andrekin's idea here is to trade the queens as well, and then try to hold the position. I would a c6 pawn um, will be guarded by the rook. Um, and black will slowly bring the pieces together. King g7, rook a8, knight f4. Indeed, so he played queen six right away. Um, so let's see what Anish should do here. I mean, he could go b5 perhaps. I think trading is probably not a good option. So let's say b5, let's say black takes, maybe take with the rook, trying to bring the other rook in. Looks pretty pom promising for white. I mean, this queen can always switch over to the king side. Still creating threats on that side of the board. And he's also up a half a minute on the clock and he goes for b5, yeah. And now c takes b5 seems to be the uh, only move. So that was played fast. Uh, should black go a4 here, not to allow white to play a4? Um, it's a good question. Yeah, I guess a4 is a move, solving white from fixing spawn on a5. However, I feel like white is getting too much time. Like rook e b1, bring the rook into the game. You can go king to g7. But then let's say we move the queen over with rook to b7 to come. This looks extremely dangerous for black. So I don't know. I think what he should maybe do is go, let's say, king g7. Because what white wants is to go rook b1 and queen f3. Right. And he pretty much controls the entire board. However, if you go rook b1 here, black is still in time to go king rook to b8. And now if you go rook queen f3, I trade a pair of rooks. And you cannot take because that hangs your queen. And the same happens if you were to play queen f3 first and black still has rook b8 and it's still in the game you know so let's see what uh but you know what's the problem here for black even if uh black brings the pieces on the queen side there will be knight f3 and the h4 pawn will be hanging so here andrekin decides that it's it's enough to have this knight on h5 for so long and he brings the knights uh all other other side like knight a5 can be a possibility Right, so rook e1 has just been played by any, so maybe he should go king to h7. I mean, knight of five, I guess we just take. And also, it's important to point out that stuff like rook b8 is coming into the position. So, not looking easy here for Andrake. And yeah, I don't really see how he should try and keep this one uh, together. So, let's see what he will do. Yeah, and this, um, this is getting really um, worse and worse for Andre Kin. Uh, he's down to two minutes and 30 seconds, two minutes uh, difference right now. And rook b8 is a serious threat uh, as black cannot take this uh, rook. So uh, he, he would roast the queen on c8. Um, there is actually a possibility to go for queen f, f3 and rook b7 or to start with rook b7 first. Yeah, I really like that idea to uh, switch your attention over to the to the um, king side. The difficult thing for black always is that let's say we play uh, queen of three, right? So I'm like knight of five, I feel like shouldn't really work in black's favor because we're going to take. And if you take with the e-pawn, you leave this pawn hanging over here. And if you take with the g-pawn, then you expose your own king. So let's see how Anish will try to increase the pressure here. It's looking really good for him, also given the fact that Andrei is down to two and a half minutes on the clock. Yeah, that's right. So the uh, time uh, time control uh, once again uh, is um, 10, 15 minutes plus 10 seconds. So at this point, players are getting only 10 seconds increment per move, uh, which is not too much when you're having time time trouble. It's just not too much to 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 make and. Uh, uh, yeah, obviously they cannot pre-move 
anything and it takes a little bit more time to play over the board. Indeed, yeah, you cannot get flagged, but um, it's definitely still very much possible to, to make mistakes, especially in a position like this where you are under pressure. Rook b6 got to be a transmission error. I'm pretty sure I need to play the move rook to b7 because rook b6 doesn't do anything. Yeah, yeah I'm just going to call that out. No, I mean, there's no way. He played rook b7. Unless he wants to right. play knight b5, knight d6. That is an option, true. But hmm, I would be surprised if Anish played rook to b6. But let's wait for it. This will find out shortly. Yeah. It can also be something like waiting move, uh, Benjamin. Because you, uh, if you play king h7, then uh, all the moves can come with the threats. On f7, queen f queen f3, or rook b7. And True, move. yeah, that could be an idea. Yeah. Queen c5 has just appeared on the board by Entraking, hitting this pawn over here. Wait, did he play rook b7 or not? I can't, can't tell. It looks like a very weird move to me, but... Oh, he has played rook b6. Huh. Huh. <laughs> I like Wait. this move because you make your opponent think a little bit longer because you have these sneaky moves with knights. 95, 96, 66, and uh, you're waiting for uh, your discussing uh, the move. Yeah, I was so sure that there was a uh, uh, error because now he goes queen f3, and if the rook be in b7, he'd be hitting this. But now, the question is can black get away? Although, I mean, capturing this pawn looks tricky. I mean, you're not getting checkmated right away. Why well, can go uh, rook b7? Uh, you can go check right away, rook, rook b8 check, and uh, try to get a pawn on f7. Uh, sorry, what, what were you saying? Rook, 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 b, rook b8 uh, instead of rook b7. Ah, true. Yeah, rook b8 is also an option. You're giving a check. Mm -hmm. Black takes, king h8. I guess we have to go here. We trade, and okay, yeah. White takes here, but I guess in the end, black takes here, and at least, you know, black traded off all these active rooks for white's active pieces. The knight's under attack, and black uh, has a lot of counterplay. Queen wants coming as well. So instead of all that, after queen f3, and Draken played rook to f8, um, preemptively defending this pawn on f7. I kind of like this move. I guess his idea is that if I go rook d6, maybe now we just want to go king h7 and defend this rook. Right. Let me by the way, getting down to two minutes and 10 seconds, uh, and Draken has 1 minute and 43 on the clock, rook b8 on the rook board. Was played. All right, so not a big question. I guess if you take now and move the king over, then that should be an improved version for white, right? Like, let's say we take king h7. Let's say you take, you take. Let's say you take, we take here. I mean, the difference is that there we had a passed a pawn, um, and here we don't, because this a pawn is still on the board. So let's see, and Dragon Butter getting down to one minute on the clock. Ani still having two minutes and 20 seconds on the clock, very, looking very, very tough here for and Draken. What do you think he's going to do? So, so hard to. Oh, he, he picks up the A3 pawn. Oh. Right. But can he get away with that? I mean, White is so active. It feels like there should be something here, but I can't really tell right away what it would be. Um, hmm. Maybe rook b3, rook b7, just to chase the queen. Like rook b3, because um, if queen goes on c1 or a1, you play king h2, and then black ha has to play without the queen. Like True, queen is too yeah. far. Yeah. That makes sense, yeah. And then at if some you play point queen you e7, want then take... rook 3 to b7, and uh, this rook is very active. Exactly, he would be rook to b7 and white uh, pretty much wins the game because black cannot defend against this. So let's see what uh, Anish will do here. Anish, by the way, also getting below one and a half minutes on the clock. This is getting very, very tense, you guys. If Anish, oh, he trades on f8? Huh. But okay, recaptures? Uh, he wants to play knight c6 and rook b8. Knight c6 is on the board. Now so king h7 seems to be the move to run away from this uh, 
Uh, Treads and queen f6, Benjamin. How about queen f6 move? Queen f6 attacking h4. If you play knight f5, then rook b7, and your f7 pawn is um, hanging. Uh, that's a nice point. Yeah, I like I like that. Uh, but and Drake can play queen of c5. I think it's really anyone's game now. Both players around a minute. This knight's under attack. Black is up a pawn here. And what does white do? I mean, you can give a check here. The king goes to h7. I mean, if we trade black recaptures, you cannot take as the leaves your knight hanging. So I don't know. I think Anish has, has uh, misplayed this quite seriously. I mean, what what should he do now with the knight on c6? How about rook b7? Right, rook b7, knight also an option. Turning, but I then knight f5, I really like that, that idea, yeah. And it feels like black's king is kind of safe over here. I mean, this knight and the five does a good job. How about knight f7, Benjamin? Knight f7, queen f6. Take, oh, that's a nice point. <laughs> crazy. Right, and I guess I cannot protect this knight properly, right? How how I will bar is not moving. How it can be equal in this position? This is strange. I guess Black still has a miraculous defense, but I kind of like your uh, idea. But perhaps then after ninety seven, we just should ignore this knight with let's say King G seven and how is White uh, breaking through? Anish, by the way, getting down to twenty seconds on the clock. He's down a pawn here. If he loses this game, it'll be all over for Anish. Oh, it's wow. looking very very tough. That's so risky situation for him. He has to make a move now. He has to do it now. Because you know, after yeah. after a move, you just get 10 seconds increment and you still have very complicated position. Rook B7 nice. played with five seconds on the clock. He is threatening checkmate though, but I guess Black's move net of five is quite natural. I mean, there's no there's no other move in the position. You cannot let White take here. So even Drake will play net of five to keep the pressure on Anish. I think we're going to see this move 97 there. After knight I, 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 I guess so too. Yeah, is knight the eight an option? Hitting this. Knight seven on the board, by the way. Knight seven on the board. Right, so I guess he realizes he cannot take the knight because of queen of six, as you pointed out. So I guess so let's say king g7, right? White takes here. Can we take with the g pawn? I guess so, right? Because yeah, I think it's e pawn. I'm a bit worried about this. Otherwise, yeah. But Either way, it feels like Anish is fighting for a draw here. He has only 18 seconds on the clock. And Drake and Bado also getting really low on time, having 30 seconds. But he is up a pawn here. And if Anish doesn't have a perpetual one way or another, yeah, but it's going to be very can tough he for him. Take the knight f5, g takes f5, and queen f4 to threaten queen g5 check? That is an option, yeah. Uh, let's see what he's going to come up with for king g7 mm -hmm. on the board. Okay, I guess white has to take here. So, yeah, maybe queen f4. Four. Okay, knight takes g6. What's oh, that, that? that's. I was thinking initially, like, that's got to be an error, but it's actually not that easy because if you take, there's queen g4 check, the king was over, and you have queen of four with a draw, or rook takes of seven. But isn't. Huh. This black of a knight takes g6 that looks so tricky. What does Andre do here? The hates this move. The evil bar oh, says. Queen c6 bad. hitting the rook. What do you do if you take this rook over here? You black takes here, and your knight on b7 is knight on h8 is simply getting trapped. Oh my god, is Anish Giri gonna lose here? With rook h7? Rook h7 is an option. I was wondering, like, what happens if we take here? Maybe just take and king back. The knight is still getting trapped. This knight on f5 covers pretty much all the squares, and he's gone for that. He sacrificed here, and knight takes h8. But let's say king g7, queen, queen h5, h5, though. But what do you threaten? What do you threaten? Like, I don't think you have a single threat. So maybe just, just with a knight g6. Maybe queen. Is Anish... Oh, queen c3. He's captured on c3. Aha, uh -huh, very tricky. Right, so now black still has this past a pawn. I don't think white has any perpetual because the design f5 can always come back to black. It's looking very tough for Anish. He only has a couple seconds on the clock. What is he going to do here? He's probably yes. looking for some um, peace sacrifices and perpetual check, like queen g6, queen f7 checks. But uh, black can wait, avoid he didn't flag checks. right? Knight f7 play with five seconds on the clock, but still, what is the threat? What is the threat? I don't see it. I mean, maybe just check and take this pawn over here, looking very, very tough for uh, Anish. Perhaps the knight g5, still very tricky. No, that's fine. Wanna... That's fine. You take f2 pawn, then you give a check again, and queen h1, knight g3 trades the queens, and you are winning. Oh. Queen c4. 
over here. Okay, 96 <laughs> still. Queen, oh, but you take this also perfect. this pawn over here. Queen E1 here, uh, King H2, and uh, Queen H1, right. Benjamin. Right, you can do that, but you can pick up this pawn first. Take an E5 with a check. The king is forced to go back. Yeah. And then, indeed, you can go for your idea with trading the queens. That should be winning for black with these two passers. Also, this pawn on h4 blocks white's entire king side. That's definitely a nice option for Draken. Doesn't he? He should have something better, right? Let's see what he will come up with. What a game. I think for, for me, this, this way to get into the queen end game is the safest way. You guarantee yourself a draw, you don't risk too much. Right. Because if so you just way, make Anish... a pass move here, a4, then queen h7, queen f7 comes uh, maybe with a checkmate or the other way, queen f7, queen h7. Indeed, yes. Yeah. So Anish has, by the way, accumulated one minute on the clock and Dragon getting down to 12 seconds. What is he going to do here? Maybe knight e3, because if you take perhaps the king just steps up and you run out of moves and you try and checkmate over here. Let's see what he's going to do. 20, it looks like he actually has 20 seconds. I mean, if Anish Gear loses this game, he's going to be at queen e1 on the clock. King h2, he can afford to repeat the position. Queen h1, let's go. Queen h1. Queen yes. h1 on the board. <laughs> Your suggestion. Okay, so knight g3. It's not over yet, but it feels like black should be winning here, right? I mean, we take the queen. Two extra pawns and those pawns are so far. Uh, there can be a way that this pawns can be pushed and the king will come and capture the um, king side pawns or just help help with the, with the king to those pawns. King right. d5, king... Uh, d4 a king d5 but you how right because if you go king d4 there's knight b3 no, 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 with a check no, no, and you pick no, up the pawn no, no, a5 don't oh pawn d4 yes this way right yeah but at the same time white is going to come up on the board of this side so okay i guess d4 right and king to d5 that looks really good white's king side is not going anywhere this pawn on h4 is blocking everything pawn d4 on the board by andraken it's looking really tough here for anisha don't quite see it is he just going to get knocked out here Wow, this is truly unbelievable to lose this game. Uh, it seems like the time was so important. Still, the knights are on the board. This dance can be very tricky. Um, what can be the possibility if, uh, if a white captures d4 pawn and then sacrifices knight for a pawn, there can be somewhere a draw? Yeah, so he's playing knight c5, pawn d4 on the board. Um, I guess if white can sacrifice the knight, the knight for both pawns, he should be drawing. However, I don't see how he can do it. I mean, let's say Black just goes king to d5, hitting the knight. Where do you go? I mean, uh, knight of four check, I guess king f3 has got to be played, hitting the knight. D3. Okay, maybe king d3 is an option or king d5 hitting the knight because where do you go, right? I guess you have to go to a4, but I don't know. It's not over just yet. I mean, it's not too easy to push these pawns. Down a board, also in drinking very low on the clock. So he needs to be careful here. King d5. King d5. Okay, I guess now knight a4. You don't want to go to b3. Okay, knight a4 on the board. Maybe knight e6. Knight a6 to c5 looks really good, but white is going to create his own pass over g4. However, I guess black is always faster there, right? Yeah, black is uh, faster. You can also keep the knight on the on the king side, I, I suppose. Ninety six looks very nice. Ninety six truly looks very nice move. Right, ninety six on the board. G three by Anisha wants to create his own passer. So let's see what Andraken should do here. I mean, I guess if you think maybe just H four right away, like try to push the pawn as quickly as possible. Okay, he has taken. I guess H four. That that's what I would do. Because if you take here, I guess knight C five. You just uh, black should be faster, um, but let's see what he will do. Oh, but, but then maybe D. But then I can always come back. Sure. It's it's gonna become quite quite messy, I think. H four on the board by Anish. Maybe what you can do, Kings uh, D three on the board by Andraken. Okay, if you so play if knight you go... B two here, then D two, and you push both pawns. And now uh, you can you can play King D four. True, or perhaps you can play what I'm King c4, that looks like a really good move because he's just going to go king b3, hit the knight. This knight on e6 is taking away the square on c5. You can only go to b6, but then there's coming d2 and king c2. And how is Anish going to deal with this? I mean, maybe h5, king b3, and h6. I guess that's his only option, forcing the knight to go back. 
But then still, the king comes to the c2 after knight c5 check. So I think it's going to be all over. Benjamin. This is losing because uh, uh, yeah. Black's king is very active and the pawns are too far. White's king can't catch, catch those pawns. Indeed, yeah, Anish has a minute on the clock here, but I don't think there's anything in the current position. I guess you go h5, but king b3, h6, knight f8. And I think black is just uh, winning there. He's played the move h5, but I don't see a defense here for Anish. I think he's simply going to get knocked out. And what does that yeah, mean for a chance of qualifying for the candidates? A... That's going to be such a heartbreaking for, uh, for him and uh, his fans. Yeah, oh, king b3 on the board, knight c5, knight x5, h6, and then knight d4 comes on the way. So h6 is played, uh, knight f8. Now this knight can we also jump on g5, but knight f8 is just too far from white's king. And there will be no threats. Knight is already on f8. White's knight is hanging, and after knight c5, king comes on c2. There is no check. D2 is a threat, and I am finding it really hard to find a way how to avoid it. How about knight e6? Uh, 96 is an option. I guess black can either just push this pawn down the board or just go knight h7. But it might be a nice move to try to confuse black a little bit because if you go, uh, let's say, knight h7, at least the knight jumps back to d4, right? But still some less checks. I guess if you go knight e4, we just go pawn to d2, takes, takes, um, king of four, a4, king of five, a3, king of six. You're just nowhere near in time. I think it's just all over for Anish. I don't see how you can oh, save this one. 30 seconds on the board. No promising move for, for him. And he might say um, goodbye to the to the finals. He might not make the finals for after this uh, game. 96 yeah. on the board. 96 on the board. D2 by N. Draken. So you can take this knight over here. But after D1, queen, this pawn is not going anywhere. But I can just go queen H5. Stop it. And it looks like... like just queen also, there's this straight this straight away. Benjamin and also wins. And as we speak, Anish Giri has resigned. So Dimitri and Draken qualifies to the final. Quite a shocker because Anish Giri was a big favorite going into today's match. Also, he got great positions in both games out of the opening, but he was not able to convert them. And, and Draken took full use of his advent, uh, of his chances. And Caddy and Draken will be facing off against Report in the finals. Who would imagine this scenario, Benjamin, uh, after <laughs> Uh, after after the uh, way how Mag uh, how Anish Kiri played the group stage, he was truly in a good shape. That he started so nicely today. That he had a very good chance. I think even a very good position, a slightly better position. And now because of uh, one mistake here in the second game, seems like he has to say goodbye to the finals of the Grand Prix. And we do have Richard Rafford against Dimitri Andrekin at the finals of the Grand Prix second leg. Wow, that was unexpected, Benjamin. Yeah, no, I, I think nobody really saw this one coming. Yeah, and Drakin, uh, he's had a bit of luck in this tournament. I mean, first of all, winning the group looked almost impossible at some point because he had a losing position against Bakro in the last round of the group stage. But he managed to win that one and make his way to the semifinals. And now he beats Anish Giri with, uh, with the black pieces in this game. And yes, yeah, in the first, it... uh, first leg, he was supposed to play in the first uh, leg, but due to the COVID, uh, he couldn't make it. So there, we had uh, the replacement for uh, Dimitri Andrejkin. There was a Sipenko uh, Andre, but then for the second leg, he could make it and he made it all the way to the finals. So congratulations to these players, Richard Rafford and Dimitri Andrejkin. They already guaranteed themselves 10 points of the Grand Prix. One of these two players is going to get the maximum points of the Grand Prix, which is so, so, so important for Richard Rafford. This is the final leg. And I suppose he is in the situation when he has to try to win and the, um, the whole knockout, uh, whole um, leg. Wow, what a day, what a day. It was uh, really interesting games indeed. Um, no one really expected it from, from the very beginning at the, at the opening. Anish Kiri had very good position um, advantage and then he had a lots of ways to um, 
even um, increase this advantage into the uh, winning position, but the things turn the other way because of the time and we do have here but less time than the uh, classical chess and the rest of the games. We're going to take a very short break right now and coming back right after that. So don't go anywhere, guys. We're going to sum up the day. Welcome back, everyone. This is FIDEC Grand Prix 2022, uh, second leg and the uh, final day of the semifinals as we are, we had the tie breaks. 
And this is your rapid recap uh, game two when Anish Giri plays with white pieces against Dimitri Andrekin. The first match ended in a draw uh, rather fast and second game was very important. If the game was also tied uh, with a draw, then we would see uh, we could see the blitz games between these two players. But the things went so crazy in this game. Let's start to see it, Benjamin. Yeah, so Anisha opened up with 1e4 and Draken played pawn c5, knight f3, e6. So they had this in the classical portion already in which Anish played the move b3. He got a very good position in that game, but in this game he decides to go for the main line. So the move d4 and Draken trades, knight takes, knight c6, knight c3, and a6. This is a bit of a sideline of the Taimanov. Uh, white trades on c6 and goes bishop to d3. And so white has a quite nice and easy development here. However, black has a lot of pawns in the center. So Anish castled, knight f6, and he played the move queen to f3. So once again, white wants to get his pieces out uh, nice and, and quickly. Yes, this queen f3 looks a little bit artificial move to be in front of the f pawn and to be developed before the bishop and the rooks. Uh, but the idea of queen f3 is to stop black's development on the queen side, a king side. For instance, if black goes with bishop e7 right now, then white comes uh, with straightforward queen g3, which hits the pawn on g7. And in case of castle, white will also develop the bishop with a baiting threat, bishop h6 now creates a threat uh, on g7. And if knight comes on h5 to attack the queen and the guard g7 pawn, then queen g4 is a brilliant move here. And black gonna have some uh, struggle. Instead of knight h5, black can go this knight on e8. But look at this position, black is so passive, having most of the pieces on the back ring, and white is uh, very ahead of development and having a slightly better uh, position. So instead of bishop e7 and king side development, and Draken first decided to develop the queen side, and he went bishop to b7. Right, so he played bishop b7, so Anish just played a bit of a waiting game, he played rook to e1, and as soon as Draken played bishop e7, now he played queen to g3. Once again, it's pretty annoying for black to deal with this threat towards the pawn on g7. So Andrekin came up with a move h5. Now here, Anish perhaps could have just captured his pawn on g7. We were not quite able to figure out what Andrekin had in mind there. But Anish just played the calm and collected h3. So that if black was h4, he cannot follow up with h3. So Andrekin played king f8, defending this pawn on g7. Here, Anish developed with the move bishop to f4. And after h4, he uh, played queen to f3, keeping the queen on an active square. And once again, for Andrekin, it's difficult to come up with a move here. So he played the move king to g8. And for Anish, the position is quite easy to play. He just brought another piece into the game, rook 81. And now Andrekin played knight to h5 to attack the bishop on a 4. Yes, white surely uh, doesn't want to give up this uh, bishop and the diagonal of h2 and b8. So Anish withdrew the bishop on h2, kept his bishop, and uh, Andrekin went the bishop b6. D6. Uh, yeah, black's idea here is to trade as much pieces as possible and to get some counterplay out of it. Uh, here, white could make uh, several, uh, several moves, like bishop uh, knight a4, trying to push c4 and open up the position, or knight e2 with the same idea, c4. Instead, uh, Anish went for bishop d6 straight, queen takes d6, and now e5. Uh, he tries to uh, close the center and take away f6 square from the knight, which is on h5. And after queen b4, which was played by Andrekin, here Anish went for knight e2. And Benjamin, is this pawn on b2 hanging? Well, this pawn on b2 is hanging, but it is poisoned, because if you take on b2, white goes rook to b1, hitting the queen. And if the queen moves, you take on b7, and white is on b2. So you cannot take the pawn so instead of that, and Draken played the move g6, making sure that he can move the king up or perhaps move the knight back into the game. So Anish played c3, hitting the queen, the queen dropped back, and here b4. So Anish wants to put his knight on d4, and black can still play the move c5, but in that case, white will take, and white will get a very strong knight on d4. So when Draken played the move a5, trying to uh, put pressure on white structure, Anish played a3, and bishop to a6. He realized that this bishop b7 was very passive, so he wanted to trade it off for this active bishop on d3. 
So Anish played knight d4, bishop takes d3, queen takes d3, and and Draken played queen b7. And so here it looks like white should still be quite a bit better. But perhaps if black can get a couple more moves, maybe he can neutralize the position. That's right. Here Anish went for rook b1, which looks very natural move as white uh, oh, is hoping to open up the b file with next move b5 uh, to bring the uh, both rooks on the b file and double these rooks over here. So Andrekin went queen a6, uh, hoped for queen trade to get into the end game where it's uh, more safety uh, for black. And here well, white pushed b5 and forced uh, black to trade these pawns and to get the rook on b5. So here white's idea is to bring another rook on b5, double this rook, and also threaten some sort of checks on b8. Rook b8, um, as rook can't capture this rook, queen a6 will be hanging. In some positions, there is also knight, uh, queen f3 ideas to attack the pawn on f7 uh, with rook b7. So white has everything you can uh, ask for and black has really passive pieces the uh, rooks are not connected as the king is in the middle now and the knight on h5 is just too far away from all the actions so uh benjamin then what happened here indeed so and dragon realized that this knight on h5 was kind of off so he played knight to g7 eventually he wants to bring this knight back into the game and he should play rook eb1 queen c8 and here a move that surprises quite a bit. He played the move rook to b6. Initially, we were wondering if this might have even been a transmission error, because we were really expecting the move rook to b7, because then he can follow up with queen f3 and put a lot of pressure on his pawn on f7. But rook b6 was played, queen c5, queen f3, and then Draken played rook f8, preemptively defending this pawn on f7. Anish played rook to b8, putting more pressure on Andraken's position, and Andraken captured his pawn on a3, and this is really where Anish missed a big opportunity. Anish had two minutes and 20 seconds on the clock, and Draken down to one minute and 14 seconds. And Anish here had to move knight to b5. It hits the queen. Now it leaves the rook on b8 hanging, but if you take white takes here, and the rook on b1 is actually protected, so white wins a queen for a rook and should be winning here. And what else does black do, right? I mean, if black goes to queen to c5, then we go knight to d6. This knight on d6 is super strong. We threatened to take on f7, and I don't know, it would be really tough for Andraken to hold on here. Like, rook b7 is also coming in lot, lots of positions, and white has a lot of pressure here. So that was probably a big missed opportunity for Anish, but instead of that, he took an f8, and Draken recaptured, and he played the move knight to c6. Yeah, now that uh, threat is rook b8, uh... Uh, and white wins a queen. So Andraken had to step this queen uh, somewhere else uh, out of the back ring. So queen c5 uh, has been played and Anish went here for rook b7. The knight on c6 is sacrificed, but if you take this uh, knight by the queen, then queen f7 comes with a check and then a checkmate on g7 as black's king is running out of the... Uh, uh, squares so this has not been played and after rook b7 there was only move here knight to f5 to cut the f file from the queen and not allow whites to take the pawn and here we have the move knight to e7 this is this is very lovely sacrifice here if you take this knight then queen comes on f6 attacks the knight and uh, in case if knight goes back on f5, then going to be a blunder to rook, uh, yeah, queen f7 or rook b8, both possibilities, but queen f7 is a checkmate in just one move. Uh, so uh, instead of this, uh, of course, black did not capture the knight on e7 and instead went for king to g7. And Benjamin White's next move here was quite a shock for us. Indeed, we expected Anish to take here on a five, and Black does not have an easy decision here. Black can take with the G pawn, but then his king will be quite exposed, perhaps queen of four and queen G5, and white should still be fine here. And if you take with the E pawn, then you allow E6 from white hitting the pawn on a seven. White is still down a pawn. I mean, Black can defend rook F8, and white needs to be very careful here um, as to how to defend. But instead of that, Anish came up with a shocking knight takes G6. Now, Black cannot take this knight with the pawn because the pawn is pinned to the king. You can take with the king, but then white goes queen g4 check. 
You cannot step back to h7 because that allows rook f7 check. So black has to go king h6. And here, rook, rook takes f7 looks very scary with rook f6 to come. White, at the very least, has a perpetual starting with queen f4, king g6, and queen g4. So I knew she probably was banking on that. But instead of that, Andraken found an extremely strong queen c6. And he's hitting this rook. And all of a sudden, the question is, OK, what does white do? Right. So I need to realize, like, OK, my knight's on attack. If I take here, Black's going to take my rook and my knight is probably going to get trapped. So instead of that, he took an F7 with the rook, like recaptured, and now he took on H8. But the problem is that after King G7, this knight on H8 is really getting trapped. And he's played Queen H5, trying to go for a checkmating attack. But Black just captured his pawn on C3. And the problem for White is that this queen and this knight are really stepping on each other's toes. Like White doesn't really have any sort of checkmate here. Also, it doesn't seem that White has a perpetual here because this knight can always come to block. Like, let's say white gets a check here. We take the knight, check, the king steps up, and after queen f7, we can always go knight to g7. So instead of that, Anish played the move knight to f7, but it felt like he didn't really have any threats here. Yeah, and it gives a black a chance to give several checks, and by those checks, black is uh, capturing the pawn. So queen e1 uh, has been played here. King has to go on h2, and queen now f2. Uh, so as white has not here this strong check, there is only uh, two checks, which drops the knight on f7. Uh, Anish would not go, wanted to go for this, and he brought the knight on g5, and now he threatens the checks on f7 or h7. But once again, it is black's time to move, and black is going to move by the checks. So queen g3 has been played. White has only moved to with rogue king back on the first rank. And now we have queen e1 check. And after king h2, uh, black captured another pawn on e5, and black collected two extra pawns at this position. Indeed, and Dragon was collecting a lot of pawns here with check. Anish played king g1, queen e3, king h2, uh, queen g3 check, king g1. And here, uh, perhaps the move for Draken would have been to go knight e3, you threaten checkmate on g2. However, in the time scramble, this is really tough to spot and actually to go for and realize that white doesn't have anything here because if white takes, there's king f6. Um, and if queen f7, it also seems that black is walking out of the checks. So Draken came up with a much more practical queen e1 check, king h2, and queen h1. Well, I mean, you might be wondering, like, wait, why does he give away his queen for free here? But if white takes, there's knight to g3 with a fork. The king had to go to g1. Now he takes here. And black is up a lot of pawns here. Also, white's king side majority is blocked here. So it feels like Andraken was very close to the win here. Yes, he was very close to, to win. And also by those checks before uh, he made by the queen, he uh, got some time on the clock. Uh, so after... Anish captured the pawn on e6. He brought the king on f6 with a tempo here. Knight has to move away. And after knight c5, uh, Andraken played king e5. So he's activating the king and he's uh, helping uh, pass pawns on a5 and d5 to be uh, to be promoted to queen. And uh, the king side here, where white has an extra pawn, is blocked so far. So white decided to bring the king on f2 uh, to try to get this king on f3 g4 and capture the h pawn and then try to or hope to stop the two pawns with the knight for uh, for for the moment but black is not losing time black pushed the pawn on d4 and now the threats are something like king d5 king c4 and those two pawns together with the king is simply hard to stop in the, yeah, it looked very tough for Anish. He played king e2, trying to bring the king closer to the queen side. But Andraken here played knight f4. Really good move, hitting the king and the pawn on g2. So Anish had to go to f3 and now king d5. An excellent move. Because if you take this knight on f4, black's going to take here and black is always going to queen much, much faster. So Anish played the move knight a4 to try to block the pawn on a5 and here knight to e6. A so really nice move by Andraken. The knight jumps back. Uh, so Anish played g3. And Draken took, and Anish played h4. So he's trying to create the last chance in a position, trying to create a past h bomb, but it feels like it's just not going to be enough. Yes, as Black now has three 
past pawns uh, actually black can push those pawns right away and now black goes with d3 so if the king goes to uh, control d pawn with king e3 then g2 pawn will be pushed and when king comes back on f2 then another pawn will be pushed so this is some sort of the maneuvering that uh, black is doing here and uh, if white still managed to stop those pawns with knight c3, then king comes on c4, and the other pawn also goes to be uh, pushed forward. So uh, instead of this, Anish decided to um, to capture now g3 pawn uh, and uh, kept the less uh, material on the board. But um, black comes with a very very powerful idea here to bring the king on c4 to annoy the knight to kick this knight from a4 and then uh, to push d2 pawn forward to d2 and this pawn will be very close to the uh, promotion square in the turnish played h5 trying to push the pawn off the board king b3 by and an excellent move the knights on attack and where is it going to go right it looks like knight c5 might be a last strike in the position but after black takes after h6 the easiest way for win here for black would be to go 94 check and then i can always come back to f6 to stop this h pawn so anish played h6 trying to push his pawn off the board but and draken played the very calm and collected knight f8 anish played knight c5 check and and draken played king c2 and here it became clear like there's no way you can stop this pawn and if you are going to sacrifice your knight for this pawn then black has another pawn that is just going to push down the board so anish played knight e6 now if you take this knight there's still h7 which might be a little bit tricky, but in Draken just played d2 and Anish resigned. Because if you take the knight in f8, we're just going to queen here. The queen is coming very quickly back to d6, hitting the knight, hitting the spawn over here. And there's just no chance left for white in the position. So in Draken picks up a huge win with the black pieces against Anish Giri in the second rapid game of the tiebreak and advances to the final. Yeah, what a game. Anish had the advantage at the opening in the mid uh, middle game, also in the uh, end game, but because of the time trouble, because of the seconds on the clock, he missed the opportunity. So he sacrificed the knight wrong way and then Draken took an advantage and then uh, played beautifully into the end game. And we saw this game and this was your rapid recap. So... We do have final two players out of 16, and those are Richard Rapport and Dimitri Andrekin. Richard is in a very good situation, as we were talking earlier, Benjamin, that he obviously hopes to play against Drakin rather than Anish Giri, because Anish is a very solid player, and he's very strong in classical uh, chess. And now uh, Richard has uh, actually really realistic chances to win the... Um, 13 points and then to get to the candidates tournament while well, Dimitri Andorikin shows his best and he's showing that he is actually ready also as well to win this tournament and to play then a final leg at the uh in the Berlin and also to take this part of the last two candidates tournament so what a tie breaks we had here today quite heartbreaking for Anish Giri indeed but he had some chances, obviously, in both games, right, Benjamin? Yeah, that's a tough part about these tie breaks. I mean, if you don't take your chances, then your opponent is simply going to take his. And that was very much the case uh, the case today. And yeah, I don't think anyone really expected Andrejkin to make it to the finals of this, like of the FIDE Grand Prix. It's starting to look very good for Richard Report for his chance of qualifying to the candidates tournament. We know that he made it to the semifinals in the first leg, and now he's already in the finals. So... He's already guaranteed him a lot of points. If he wins that final, I think he's more or less there. I mean, a miracle will have to happen for him not to qualify. And yeah, for Andraken, he already guarantees himself 10 points in this leg of the Grand Prix. So he will be coming back in the third leg. So, of course, he also still has all the chances in the world. Uh, but yeah, with all that being said and done, it was a very uh, exciting day. And Katie, I just want to thank you for being such a wonderful co-host uh, as always. Also, a big shout out to everyone who's watching on Twitch and on YouTube. You all make it uh, a lot of fun. Also, a big shout out to our producer, Wouter, behind the scenes. And Katty, I'll leave the final words up to you. <laughs> thank you very much, Benjamin. And thank you also for the work you're doing for, for, for us and for our uh, um, viewers. Um, that's uh, obviously my 
pleasure to be your co-host. Um, it was another day, another uh, fighting day for the players, and we're going to come back with the uh, back to classical chess and classical time control with final two games. And in case if we have the tie in twin, between these two players in the final, we can also see one more time tie breaks. So all of this can happen um, and we're coming back from tomorrow. Thank you very much everyone for being here and don't forget to come back tomorrow, same place and same time. Bye bye.